Known as the political and cultural heart of the city, Parliament Hill is in an area of land located on the southern banks of the Ottawa River in downtown Ottawa. The Parliament buildings, a collection of Gothic-style structures, directly overlook the river. The 53-bell carillion on the Peace Tower marks each quarter hour. In the early morning, excitement could be felt as members of the Jamaat waited for Hazur's arrival at Parliament Hill. Arriving at around 10.30 a.m., Hazur was welcomed by Judy Sugro, Member of Parliament for Liberals, the ruling party of Canada. Even the sun is shining for yes, your visit right. today. Yeah. Knowing that Hazrat Amirul Mominin was visiting Parliament Hill, several members of Parliament came to meet with Hazur. We're going to Kamal Khera and Ramesh uh, Sangar from Brampton, where the community is growing. It's an honor to see you again, sir. Thank you very much for gracing our country with your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Hazrat Amirul Mominin led Zohar and Asr prayers within one of the halls in the Parliament building. Hazur was given an extended tour of Parliament Hill and its surrounding grounds. Later in the afternoon, Hazur met with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Pleasure to welcome uh, His Holiness to Ottawa. The, uh, last time we met was a number of years ago and I didn't get occupied this office, but uh, we had uh, wonderful conversations as uh, we will this time about uh, the Ahmadi community and the uh, challenges they face and the opportunities to work uh, together on uh, promoting uh, love for all and hatred for none. Please be seated. Assalamu alaikum. Through with your permission, we will begin with the translation, with the recitation of the Holy Quran by Sheikh Abdul Hadi Saab. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان والإحسان ويتاء ذي القربى وينحى عن الفحشاء وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يَعِزُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ وَعَوْفُوا بِأَحْدِ اللَّهِ إِذَا عَاهَدْتُمْ وَلَا تَنْقُذُوا وَلَا تَنْقُذُوا الْأَيْمَانَ بَعْدَ تَوْكِيدِهَا
I have recited verses 91 to 92 from Surah Al-Nahl, chapter 16, from the Holy Quran. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. Verily, Allah requires you to abide by justice and to treat with grace and give like the giving of kin to kin and forbids indecency and manifest evil and transgression. He admonishes you that you may take heed and fulfill the covenant of Allah when you have made and break not the oaths after making them firm while you have made Allah your surety. Certainly, Allah knows what you do. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the ever merciful. It is with great honor that I welcome all of you to our program here at the Sir Johnny McDonald Building, the Government of Canada's permanent home for meetings and ceremonial functions. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, we thank the Government of Canada and our Parliamentary Friendship Association Chair, the Honorable Judy Sagro, for coordinating this program here today. On behalf of the Jamaat, I would like to thank our honored guests, including ministers, members of parliament, senators, ambassadors, clergy, and distinguished guests that are here with us. I will now introduce the first part of the program, the presentation of the annual Sir Zerfullah Khan Award for Public Service. The announcement of this award and its recipient was also made at our annual Jalsa Salana last weekend to an audience of 26,000. The Zerfullah Khan Award honors leading Canadians who have made outstanding contributions in the fields of public office and service to humanity at large. Sir Muhammad Zerfullah Khan was one of the founding fathers of Pakistan and is known for drafting the Pakistan Resolution, being the first foreign minister of Pakistan and for his tenure as the representative of Pakistan at the United Nations. The Sir Zerfullah Khan Award is thus awarded to the person who exemplifies the qualities of sincere dedication to the, to the services of society and for the greater good of humankind at large. With this understanding of the award's name, let me now tell you about the recipient of this year's award. The recipient has a rich history both in academics and human rights. She has served in many different roles throughout her prosperous career, many of which have involved advancing the cause for human rights and rule of law throughout the world. The recipient's career, which was noticeably flourishing throughout the 70s and 80s, was appointed to the Supreme Court of Ontario, High Court of Justice, in 1987 and to the Court of Appeal for Ontario in 1990. In 1999, recognizing her proficiency and talents, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien appointed her to the Supreme Court of Canada. This year's recipient has received honorary doctorates by 27 universities and, her work, and has worked tirelessly in the ever-needed field of human rights law. Therefore, it is with great pleasure and extreme honor that we present the 2016 Sir Muhammad Zerfullah Khan Award for Distinguished Public Service to the Honorable Louise Aber.
Your Holiness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just say a few words uh, to convey to you how deeply honored I am to receive this very prestigious award named after a great jurist, lawyer, judge, and a great uh, diplomat. I'm particularly uh, honored uh, to be associated with his name uh, since he was a chief uh, judge and president of the International Court of Justice, where I currently serve as an ad hoc uh, member of the court. Uh, I also want to stress to you that I first came um, aware of the great work of the Ahmadiyya community when I was the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. I met a delegation from that uh, community when I was based in Geneva, and I have continued to be deeply impressed by the promotion of the culture of peace that this uh, community has stood for and stands for in this very troubled world. Thank you, Madame Arbor. I will now request the Honorable Kirsty Duncan to take the podium and share her remarks as the official representative of the government. Members of Par uh, His Holiness, members of parliament, senators, excellencies, distinguished guests, friends. Good evening and welcome. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Assalamu alaikum. Mira naam kirsti hai. Mujapko aaj milke bolt kushi hai. It's an honor and privilege to be here tonight to welcome His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Mazrur Ahmed the fifth caliph and leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to Parliament Hill. All of Parliament Hill has come together today to join His Holiness, to celebrate with the community and to demonstrate their strong support. Canada has a long and proud tradition of diversity and inclusion. Our country is stronger not in spite of our differences, but because of them. We are all here as equal members of this great country. I hope you'll allow me to speak very personally. The last time I was together with the community was at the Jamaat at Thanksgiving, a time to give thanks for family and friends. The Ahmadiyya community wanted me to convey how very thankful they were for His Holiness's visit and how much they were looking forward to his traveling across the country. The Ahmadiyya community makes an enormous difference here in Canada. Whether it's sitting down with Mr. Lal Khan Malik, raising funds for local hospitals, or raising relief for floods in Pakistan, the Ahmadiyya community always demonstrates love for all, hatred for none. On the 50th anniversary of the Ahmadiyya community in Canada, the people once again took to serving others and raised over a million pounds of food and thousands of dollars for families affected by the Fort McMurray fires. Many families even sheltered and fed evacuees. We are grateful for your efforts. I have the privilege of seeing the compassion, generosity, and kindness of the community each and every day in my constituency office. From all of us gathered here tonight, we wish His Holiness safe travels and new friendships. Jazakala. Our next guest is from the United States. Commissioner Dr. James Zogby from the United States Commission for International Religious Freedoms has uh, made his time to be here with us today. Dr. Zogby. Thank you, Your Holiness. On behalf of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, I'm honored to be with you tonight. The Commission has a long 
record of working with your community. And what has always impressed us about the Ahmadi community is how, despite being all too often victims of persecution, you remain champions for the rights of others who are being persecuted. In a world where intolerance seems to be increasing, the Ahmadiyya remain strong advocates of tolerance and goodwill. We believe, like you, that the right to proclaim and to practice one's religion peacefully and according to one's conscience is a basic human right that must be respected and never abridged by governments or by non-state actors. By saying, Your Holiness and my Canadian friends, I want to commend you for your humanity, your courage and standing for values to which we must all aspire, the right to live as free men and women, caring for each other, respecting each other, looking to those who are most vulnerable in our midst and defending their rights to believe and to practice their faith and traditions as they see fit. Thank you. Today's program is an historic moment. His Holiness visit coincides with the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat's 50th anniversary in Canada. His Holiness advocates peace and justice in the world through the true and peaceful teachings of Islam. He advocates for interfaith dialogue and cross-community cohesion. He has spoken at Capitol Hill, the UK Parliament, and to other parliaments around the world, expressing that the solution to the world's current predicaments is entrenched in the application of absolute justice and being dutiful to God and to fellow beings. It is with extreme humility and honor that Allah has given me the opportunity to introduce to you Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmed, Khalifatul Masih V, and worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. Hazur. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, <coughs> the gracious, ever merciful. <coughs> All the distinguished guests, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <coughs> First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you you for inviting me, especially our close friend, Judy Sargo, and I am I am neither a political person and nor am I the leader of a political organization. <clears throat> Rather, I am the head of the Amdiya Muslim community which is a purely religious and spiritual community. Nonetheless, irrespective of differences of background, I believe that on the basis of humanity, we are all joined together and should therefore be united. All people and all organizations must collectively endeavor to uphold human values and strive to make the world in which we live a better and far more harmonious place. <clears throat> Consequently, if human values and human rights are not upheld in one country or region, it has a knock-on effect upon other parts of the world. And such wrongdoing can spread further afield. Conversely, if there is goodness, humanity, and prosperity in one part of the world, it will have a positive effect on other societies and other people. 
as a result of modern forms of communication and transport. We are all now much closer together and are no longer confined or bound by geography. Yet it is a strange and tragic paradox that even though we are more connected than ever before, we are actually growing more distant by the day. It is extremely regrettable and a source of grief that instead of uniting and spreading love amongst mankind, the world has paid far greater heed towards spreading hatred, cruelty, and injustice. People are unwilling to take personal responsibility for their failures. And so each individual blames others and considers the division and conflicts of the world to be the fault of everyone else but them. Consequently, we are passing through a time of great uncertainty and no one can truly comprehend what the consequences of our actions will be, both in the short term and in the long term. In this age, when the fear of Islam is on the increase in much of the world, let me reassure all of you that Islam is not what you, what is, what you commonly see or hear portrayed in the media. As far as my knowledge of Islam is concerned, I only know of that Islam whose teachings are based on its name. The literal meaning of the word, of the word Islam is peace, love, and harmony. And all of its teachings are based upon these noble values. However, unfortunately, it cannot be denied that there are some Muslim groups whose beliefs and actions are in total contrast to this. In complete violation of Islam's fundamental teachings, they are perpetrating the most horrific violence and terrorism in its name. In light of all this, I shall now seek to share with you Islam's true and peaceful teachings. This esteemed venue where you have courageously invited me is not a house of religion and probably there are many amongst you who are not personally interested in religion. However, in your capacities as lawmakers, you will sometimes have to deal with matters that affect the followers of religion. In this context, the Holy Quran categorically states in chapter 2, verse 257, that there should be no compulsion in religion. What a clear, comprehensive, and unequivocal statement that enshrines freedom of thought, freedom of religion, and freedom of conscience. Thus, my belief and my teaching is that every person in every religious town, city, or country has the undisputed right to choose his or her religion and to practice it. Furthermore, every individual has the right to peacefully preach and propagate his or her teaching to others. These freedoms ought to be guaranteed as basic human rights. And so legislative assemblies or governments should not <coughs> unduly involve themselves in such matters. Otherwise, there is a risk that their intrusion could be viewed as a source of provocation and lead to frustration and resentment. 
Sadly, in today's world, we are seeing how Muslim governments are themselves interfering in such personal matters, and this is a root cause of the instability and conflicts in those countries. The only beneficiaries are extremist religious clerics and militants who are taking advantage of the frustration of people by promoting barbaric violence and senseless conflict. However, it cannot be said that Western governments who claim to be truly democratic are entirely innocent or blameless. Rather, in the West, we also see that sometimes laws are, or rules are enacted that are in conflict with Western claims of being beacons of universal religious freedom and tolerance. Laws are occasionally created that contradict the view that every person in the Western world is free to believe whatever he or she desires and to have the liberty to live peacefully according to his or her faith. It is not wise for governments or parliaments to place restrictions on the basic religious practices or beliefs of people. For example, governments should not concern themselves with what type of clothing a, a woman chooses to wear. They should not issue decrees stating what a place of worship should look like. If they overreach in this way, it will be a means of restlessness and heightening frustrations amongst their people. Such grievances will continue to, in, uh, to exacerbate if they are not checked and ultimately will threaten the peace of society. Of course, I am not advocating that people with extremist views should be tolerated or free to pursue their beliefs. Wherever and whenever someone uses his religion to justify cruelty and injustice or to usurp the rights of others or to act against the state or in a way that affects the security of the nation, it is certainly the responsibility of the government and authorities to firmly stop such evil practices. In such circumstances, it is entirely justified and proper for the government, parliamentarians and other um, relevant authorities to ensure that such people are rooted out and punished in accordance with the law of the land. Nonetheless, in my view, what is wrong is for the state to needlessly interfere with peacefully held religious beliefs and practices. <clears throat> the Islam that we know and practice teaches that the love of your country is an essential part of your faith as a Muslim. According to Islam, a person's country is the one in which he lives and from which he derives benefit. And when such a teaching is ingrained in a Muslim's heart and mind, it is impossible for him to think ill or to desire any harm to his country. Furthermore, Islam teaches that not only should the law of the land punish anyone who acts against his country, but also that such people will surely enter the court of God Almighty and be held according, um, uh, accountable by him for their misdeeds and disloyalty. And, uh, hence, there is no need to fear a true Muslim. 
and there is no need for the government to enact laws that infringe upon relatively small religious issues or practices, which neither cause harm or danger to the members of the public or to the state. To legislate on such matters can only be described as an unnecessary interference and an invasion of those freedoms that the West claims to champion. That is the right of each person to live with liberty and personal autonomy. Undoubtedly, that such unjust interventions cannot have any positive effect that can only lead to frustration, restlessness, and discord. It is the task of the government and the parliamentarians as guardians of their nations to legislate in a way that gives rights to their citizens rather than take their rights away. <clears throat> this should be done across the board indiscriminately so that the rights of all people, whether they be Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, or the people of any other belief, including those who are not religious, are upheld and guaranteed at all times. As I have already said, it is a cause of deep sorrow that in both the Muslim world and also among some developed non-Muslim countries, certain pol policies have been made that undermine these core freedoms which have in turn caused grievances amongst segments of the public. Therefore, rather than seeking superficial plaudits, they should look at the bigger picture of how they can bring peace to their nations and ensure that their country and the wider world becomes united and increasingly prosperous. Yet, unfortunately, instead of taking a long-term view, it seems that most leaders or governments have joined an unhealthy race for power and a battle to assert their dominance over others. Consequently, they are increasingly willing to interfere in the personal and religious matters of their citizens due to this thirst of supremacy and control. Such policies are unwise and an unnecessary means of further destabilizing the world, especially given that we are already facing so many different problems and issues that threaten the peace of the society. For example, it is said that the climate change is a huge threat to our civilization. Another burning issue is the economic uncertainty facing the world. Further and more generally, there is the issue of an increasing lack of peace and security in much of the world. All of these issues are a result of unjust policies, inequality, and a lack of balance. If we take the issue of climate change, we see that a major cause of global warming has been the Industrial Revolution in the West, and the fact that forest and flora were excessively cut down. Only now, that such countries have fully developed, such countries have fully developed, uh, are they happy to call for a re reduction in the carbon emission or other industrial restrictions? However, such regulations, uh, regulation may slow down and curb the advancement and growth of 
emerging powers, such as India and China. And so, these riding nations may well view such restrictions as hypocritical, unfair, and an attempt by the historically dominant powers to stop them from progressing and from challenging the global order. Thus, the issue of climate change is actually not only an environmental issue, but is also contributing to the world's lack of peace and increasing resentment between nations. Similarly, in terms of the global financial crisis, many experts admit that governments have long made unwise policies and that today's fiscal uncertainty has now reached a level where it threatens the peace of the world. There are also many other factors that are contributing to the world's lack of peace and regrettably many are linked to self-serving and unjust policies that have been implemented by certain countries. Anyway, <clears throat> the ultimate result of the various risks and global threats is that the world is <coughs> rapidly moving towards an unthinkable catastrophe. Due to the current instability, both the, uh, the world's governments and the members of the public are becoming increasingly anxious and concerned. There are so many troubling issues, the world no longer knows which to prioritize. Should they focus first on the global warming and climate change? Or should they address the financial crisis? Or should they prioritize the fight against terrorism, warfare, and extremism? Or should they focus on the latest development in Syria, where Russia and the United States are openly opposing one another? Or the most recent is the direct conflict between USA and Yemen. Personally, it is my view that the most critical and pressing issue facing us is the lack of peace in the world. And it is <clears throat> a case of huge regret that the Muslim countries are the center of such instability and disorder, even though their religion has given them unparalleled teachings of how to establish and maintain peace. For example, in chapter 23, verse 9 of the Holy Quran, it is stated that the true Muslim is a person who fulfills any covenant or promises which, with which they have been entrusted. To be handed the keys to the government is a huge trust, and so we often see heads of state pledge to serve their, uh, their nations faithfully and with absolute justice. Sadly, in many cases, such honorable pledge proved to be hollow words that are not acted upon. Whereas, if this Quranic teaching was followed, we would never see division or conflict between the public and their governments. Furthermore, in chapter 5, verse 9, the Holy Quran states that even if a person or nation has enmity within, with the, another, they should still, threat, uh, should still treat them in an entirely fair and just manner, no matter the circumstances, because that is what Allah the Almighty desires. Yet today, rather than justice, we witness justice at, uh, injustice at every level of society, both between people and nations. Such inequality and disregard for fairness is directly contributing to the world's lack of security. 
In chapter 49, verse 9 of the Holy Quran, it states that if two parties or nations are in a state of conflict, then their neighbors and allies should seek to bring about reconciliation. If peace cannot be established through dialogue, then other nations should unite against whosoever is perpetrating injustice and use force to stop them. Once the aggressors adopt peace, they should not be humil humiliated and nor should unfair sanctions be levied upon them. Rather, in the interest of, of fairness and long-term peace, they should be permitted to move forward as a free society. If we assess the current conflict in uh, the Muslim world, it is clear that this principle of uniting against those who seek to undermine peace has not been observed. If the neighbor countries had sought to mediate impartially and put aside their own interests, the situation could have been contained long ago. However, it is not only the fault of the Muslim world, but other countries living in this global village of ours have also contributed to the disorder. If the major powers had acted equitably and sincerely at all times, we would not have seen such discord and we would not have seen the emergence of Daesh or extreme tribal groups in countries like Syria and Iran. Regrettably, some major powers have not played their role in establishing peace and have instead enacted unjust policies in order to serve their own interests. For example, certain Western countries have always had an interest in the oil reserves of the Arab world. And this interest has motivated their policies over a long period of time. Further, they have sold huge stocks of weapons to Muslim countries without considering the potential consequences. What I am saying is nothing new or concealed. Rather, it is well documented. For example, a report by Amnesty International published in December 2015 states that decades of reckless arms trading had contributed to the terrorism conducted by Daesh. It states, stated that the majority of the weapons being used by Daesh were originally produced in the United States and Russia. Furthermore, Patrick Wilkins, a researcher on arms uh, control at Amnesty, um, concluded the report by stating the vast and varied weaponry being used by ISIS is a textbook case of how reckless arms trading fuels atrocities on a massive scale. Certainly, it is well known that Muslim countries do not have sophisticated arms factories that could produce this, the state-of-the-art weapons used in the Middle East. And so, the vast majority of artillery being used in the Muslim world is being imported from abroad. If the major powers cease to trade arms and ensure that the other, other supply lines of, uh, uh, of the warring governments, rebels, and terrorists were cut, such conflicts could be brought to a swift conclusion. For example, it is well known that Saudi Arabia is using weapons purchased from the West in its war in Yemen, in which thousands of innocent civilians, including women and children, are being killed. And so, and so much destruction is being wrought. 
what will be the ultimate result of such arms trading? The people of Yemen, whose lives and futures are being destroyed, will not only bear hatred and seek revenge from Saudi Arabia, but will also bear hate towards Saudi's arms suppliers and the West in general. With no hope or future prospects left, and having witnessed the most horrific brutality, members of their youth will be prone to radicalization. And in this way, a new vicious cycle of terrorism and extremism, extremism, uh, extremism will arise. Are such destructive and devastating consequences worth a few billion dollars? Thus, there is no longer only a risk to the Muslim countries who are at the epicenter of today's conflicts. Rather, the threat has spread much further afield. As we have already witnessed with the recent terrorist attacks in Paris, Brussels, and the United States, there have also been lower level terrorist incidents here in Canada over the past couple of years, of which you will all be well aware. Furthermore, despite the fact that Canada lies thousands of miles away from the Arab world, still we find that Muslim youths have traveled from this country to join extremist groups in Syria and Iraq. Of great concern is the fact that, according to the Canadian government's own statistics, 20% of those who have gone to Syria or Iraq have been women, and this means they will not only have been radicalized themselves, but will also be indoctrinating and brainwashing their children in order to tackle radicalization and extremism we must also assess what are its causes and symptoms. Regrettably, most radicalized Muslims who are living in the West have no knowledge or even a basic understanding of Islam's teachings. Thus, their radicalization is a result of their personal frustration and not due to any ideological convictions or beliefs. Apart from online radicalization or hate preaching in mosques or the spread of extremist literature, I believe that a major cause of the radicalization of Muslim youths living in the West has been the economic crisis and many published reports corroborate this. There are many young Muslims who have gained qualifications, but in spite of their education, have not attained suitable employment, and so have become marginalized and frustrated. Due to economic difficulties, they are vulnerable and easy prey for extremist clerics and terrorist uh, recruiters. Hence, if young people are given fair opportunities to better themselves and to enter the workforce, it will be a means of keeping one's country safe and secure. At a global level, if only the major powers and the international institutions, such as the United Nations, had truly acted upon their founding principles under all circumstances, then we would not have seen the toxic plague of terrorism infect so many parts of the world. We would not have seen the world's peace and security <laughs> repeatedly undermined and destroyed. And we certainly would not have witnessed the huge refugee crisis which now confounds and frightens the people of Europe 
and other developed countries. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people have fled to Europe, and thousands have also come here to Canada in order to seek refuge from the terrorists who have poisoned their own nations. Though most of the refugees will be the genuine and decent people, just one or two negative incidents, as we have seen in the past year, are enough to cause panic, as we are starting to see in Europe and also, to some extent, here in North America. Hence, we are seeing with our own eyes just how uncertain the world is becoming and how hatred and anxiety has consumed and engulfed much of the world. I repeat that the, most, uh, that the root, uh, root cause remains injustice and inequality. Ultimately, a lack of fairness is also what uh, precipitated the global financial crash and the growing disparity between the rich and the poor during the past few years. I say this given that whilst developed and richer nations may have chosen to invest in, proper, uh, in uh, poorer countries, they have prioritized their own vested interests above facilitating the development of those local countries. Rather than exploitation and greed, the developed nations ought to have championed the rights of the weaker nations and sought their advancement. They ought to have sincerely helped the people of those poor nations stand upon their own two feet with dignity and honor. Yet, most regrettably, this has simply not happened. In chapter 20, 20, verse 132 of the Holy Quran, it instructs that no one should cast covetous eyes upon the wealth or resources of others. If the entire world agreed upon this one principle, then the world's financial system would be fair and just. Capit <coughs> capital would be distributed equitably and nations would reap the rewards of their God-given wealth. We would see that the world's trading would be underpinned by a desire to fulfill the human rights of others. Rather than to greedily acquire power and wealth and to fulfill personal interests at all costs. Another example of the world's injustice is reflected in the world's politics. In some countries, there are dictatorships or unjust governments. Yet, the major powers turn a blind eye to their cruelties because those governments happen to support them and facilitate the procurement of their interests. Yet, in countries where the leaders or governments do not bend to the whim of the major powers, they are quite happy to support rebel elements or to even demand regime change. In truth, there is no difference in the way the respective governments are treating their own people. The material difference is only that in some cases the governments cooperate with the major powers, whilst in others they do not. In terms of the latter category, Western military policies have been devised to remove those governments, as in Iraq and Libya. And similarly, such attempts have been made in Syria over the past few years. Time has proved Canada's decision not to take part in the Iraq war as the right one. And I also agree with your government's decision to halt its air, air strikes in Syria until the circumstances of that particular con conflict and the means to resolve it 
uh, resolve it become much clearer. At a broader level, the United Nations must also play its role in establishing peace in the world, unencumbered by politics, injustice, or favoritism. I hope and pray that Allah the Almighty enables the United Nations and the world's governments to act in this way so that true and long-lasting peace may be established. The alternative does not bear thinking about because if we continue as we are, then the world is charging madly towards a huge catastrophe in the shape of another world war. May Allah grant wisdom to the world's leaders and policy makers so that the world we leave, uh, we leave behind for our children and future generation is a world of peace and prosperity and not the crippled economy and malformed children. I mean, at the end, I would like to once again thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you very much. Seated. Our chair of the Ahmadiyya Friendship Association, Honorable Judy Sagro, would like to make a presentation. Assalamu alaikum, Your Holiness, President Malik, Madam Arbor, Ministers, Members of Parliament and all the friends of the Amadea community that are part of our friendship group. Your Holiness, uh, we've truly been honored by your presence here on Parliament today. I think you brought a level of excitement in many ways, and we very much enjoyed spending some time together today. But as you know, Canada has a long history of sharing its values of freedom and democracy abroad. This is in the same vein as your face commitment to love for all, hatred for none. So with that in mind, trying to find a small gift for you to say thank you for your coming to visit us. Thank you for your very important message and for your guidance to all of us as parliamentarians. I'm pleased to be able to present to you a signed by our prime minister a framed copy of the Canadian Charter of Frights and Freedoms that I know you will very much cherish. So I would like to present that to you on behalf of our Parliamentary Friendship Group. As is customary with the conclusions of our program, we would like to end before dinner with a silent prayer. Hazur, if I may request you to please lead us in a silent prayer. A silent prayer. I mean, what I'm hearing from His Holiness is this uh, message of peace and, and bringing people together uh, in the respect of our religious belief, our freedom of expression, and in embracing those diversity all around the world. And I'm happy that he's going there to, to share those messages to all of us. I think His Holiness uh, touched on a lot of key key themes. One of the themes I think is universality. How is the human race? We're all in this together. He also touched on some of the challenges that the religion is facing around the world. 
but more importantly, how important it is to remain steadfast in our approach towards peace. I think it's the, frankly, the only sane message that's out there at all. When you talk about the simple six words, love, you know, love for all, hatred for none, and if we could get other countries and other organizations and other religions to adopt those same six words, right, and start looking at each other and thinking of those six words rather than thinking negative that they tend to, I think it could do an enormous good in the world. And I know in my own com community we have an Amadea Mosque who regularly has interfaith community meals so that leaders from multi-faith and leaders from the community and from the nonprofit sector get together and have a meal and learn from each other and really get to know each other and it has transformed our community. Well I think the Amadea community has played a, a remarkable uh, uh, involvement in being very much involved in the community uh, here in, in the national capital region where my ride is from. Uh, the community is very present, very active, and we're seeing a, we're seeing a counter-narrative, which is an important counter-narrative to take. In fact, in a sense, it, it's sort of a little bizarre that it has to be a counter-narrative because I've always believed and always felt that uh, Islam was a religion for peace. The community is my family. I was most recently with you on Thanksgiving. To have time with His Holiness was humbling, overwhelming, and I got to hear his speech, and then we talked afterwards, and he taught me so many lessons, and the one particularly I take to heart, um, once a friend, always a friend.